Hey, uh, hello and welcome everyone to uh, SSDN's webinar, Introduction to Scanning. I'm Kayla Sayas Ruiz and I'm the Sunshine State Digital Network Coordinator. I will be here to help moderate questions today. Um, our presenter for today is going to be Stuart Rochford, and he is the uh, studio manager at Florida State University Libraries Digital Library Center and has worked at the Social Library since 2011. He holds a BFA with an emphasis on photography and graphic design and an MLIS degree from Florida State University. Uh, Stuart worked as a professional photographer and graphic designer before joining FSU Libraries. His team at the Digital Library Center mainly digitizes materials from the library's special collections department, but they often collaborate with other departments, researchers, and community partners uh, from around the Tallahassee area. And without further ado, oh, actually, quick, real, with some housekeeping, we do we have enabled a uh, live transcription. So if you'd like uh, to view closed captioning, just click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And um, this is also being recorded. Um, you will not be able to unmute your microphone or turn on your camera for the duration of the webinar. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to place those in the chat box. Uh, we will be answering questions at the end, but if a question comes up, uh, feel free to put that in the chat box and we will answer that at the end of the session. Okay, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Stuart. All right, thank you, Kayla, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, yeah, this, uh, this, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, we're basically going to talk over, talk about some basic introduction to scanning um, concepts. We're going to focus mainly on, on flatbed scanning, but we're also going to talk about some overarching concepts, um, best practices, guidelines, things to look out for when scanning. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we're going to ask you to hold the questions for the end, um, and then I'll be happy to ask or to answer any questions that you might have. So yeah, yeah, hold on tight. Here we go, y'all. All right, so um, like Kayla said, um, I work at the Digital Library Center at Florida State University Libraries. Um, and the studio manager there, uh, we digitize mainly cultural heritage material, uh, but we do digitize a wide variety of, um, of content um, ranging from partner, uh, partners, community partners and um, heritage and university archive material. Um, some of our equipment that we use in our studio, we, we use a lot of flatbeds. Um, well, we use Epson flatbed scanners. We have 12,000 XLs and 10,000 XLs. Um, and we'll see some of those later on in the presentation. We have a Book Drive Pro, which uh, is, a, is a decent book scanner. Um, it allows us to take pictures of left and right pages without harming the book. Uh, phase, phase one IQ and eight is an overhead camera that we use to digitize um, large uh, oversized items among other things and some document scanners which we don't use too often but we do have them um, for certain projects and yeah so a basic de uh, definition of digitization is uh, just creating a digital image from physical objects um, that's that's a basic way to say it and one of the main goals of digitization especially in this sort of field is to um, create a faithful representation of the original objects um, for, the, for our users um, and we've got a list of benefits and drawbacks, like most things. Um, if you have some con, um, some pros, you've got some cons. And uh, some of the benefits of digitization are that they overall um, reduce the wear and tear of the original objects. They increase the accessibility when uploaded to a repository so that the images can reach a, reach a much wider audience um, that, since not everybody can come in to see them in person. Um, so yeah, and they can also perform advanced imaging forensics, uh, such as infrared, multispectral. Um, you can analyze textures and all sorts of um, other things that you might not be able to see with your naked eye. So high resolution images can help with that. Uh, some of the drawbacks are some potential incompatibility issues with the software file formats. Um, file formats can definitely go out of date. Um, we've had to retire some of them. Um, Bitmap JPEG 2000s is one that's um, it, it was had a promising um, future, but it doesn't seem to be so commonly used that much anymore. Um, but it is it is out there. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about some file formats later and recommended file formats. 
Um, another drawback is that researchers don't get the tactile experience, which is important for some, some research projects. Um, you don't get to hold the material, um, what, but that's the, uh, that's the drawback. Um, of course, storage limitations, both digital and physical, and, um, and there's always a cost associated with both of those, which, um, yeah, budgets are always being cut and might not be what we need. So cost is something that we consider um, quite a bit. All right, so um, basic types of scanners. Um, there are so many specialty scanners out there and camera systems, but we're just going to talk about um, just a few of them here and we'll focus on, on some of these. Uh, flatbed scanners, which I'm guessing most of y'all have seen. You put it down, you close the lid, press a button, and you've got an image, essentially. Um, camera systems, book scanners, document scanners. Um, we have dedicated file and uh, file, film and slide scanners. There it is. And, um, and the, yeah, the, some of these can do multiple types of material, and, and we'll see some of that later on. Speaking of flatbed scanners, look at this. We've got the Epson 10,000 XL. Uh, this one is one that we use in our digital library center at Florida State University Libraries. Um, they are the, probably our, our workhorse, um, especially with our part-time staff. Um, the pros are that they can create some really high resolution images um, and they're good for small flat objects, items that can fit on this, um, the base on the platform on the scanning bed. Uh, they can scan film and negatives, uh, film negatives and slides, uh, transmissive material, which is, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty handy feature if you have that material in your archives. Um, they are like, extremely low maintenance and they are easy to use. Um, yeah, like I said, they're really good for part-time employees or those who might not have all the uh, technical experience um, with digital imaging uh, and software, computers in general. It's sometimes you could just, uh, with a few mouse clicks, you can press a button and you've got an image. There we go. Um, and the cons, if you've ever used these, you know how slow they can be when scanning at high resolutions. Um, yes, especially a large object, it could take um, up to I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, depending on how uh, high the resolution is and how large the object is. Another con is that they can damage books. We, we in the DLC uh, do not use these to scan books unless it's a tiny little pamphlet, booklet, something that can lay flat. Um, we don't want to damage any of our precious books. So we're very considerate of that. Um, speaking of books, we have a book scanner. This is our Atiz Book Drive Pro at the DLC. And uh, we're not going to talk too much about this, but I did want to explore it as um, an alternative to um, flatbed scanning. It's just another way to capture images, basically. Um, yeah, pros, it's uh, very gentle on fragile books, fragile books with uh, tight binding or fragile spines, anything that you want to take very good care of uh, while digitizing. Um, I would put them on a book scanner such as this. Uh, they keep the pages flat and it keeps everything stable. Um, it prevents you from having to lay it completely flat, which puts a lot of stress on older books. Um, and they have adjustable arms, so you can zoom in and out depending on the size of the book. These also allow for a quick capture of images, much quicker than flatbed scanners. They are typically tethered directly to the computer. So you take a picture and it's automatically transferred to the machine, to your image editing software. and um, and that saves a whole lot of time. With, you don't have to transfer memory cards necessarily, although that is an option, uh, depending on your institution and what you have available. The cons are they are, and they can be extremely expensive compared to uh, other types of scanners because there's a lot more that goes into it. Uh, you got cameras, you got the whole platform, the base, the lighting kits. Um, so the cost is and can be pretty high. Um, there are DIY kits out there online that you can make yourself, um, which will help save a lot of money and they can perform uh, fairly well. Uh, they also take up a lot of space. Uh, they have a very large footprint. So if studio space is an issue, um, for us, that's always a problem, figuring out where we're gonna fit things, um, not just equipment, but office areas, cubicles. Um, so that's a big consideration is uh, the footprint. They are also pretty complicated. Um, they can be uh, more, more complicated than flatbed scanners just because there's so much more that goes into it. Cameras are a different beast, um, but once trained properly and once you have some time with them, um, they can be a really handy tool to have. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this next setup, um, but this is one, this is a picture of our 
reprographic camera system in the digital library center. It's just an overhead camera, um, medium format digital back. These can capture high resolution images as well. Um, they are also very quick to capture, just like most camera systems. They can handle oversized objects. This one is adjustable height as well, zooms in and out. We have a lighting kit, which allows us to get accurate lighting, accurate color um, reproduction from these. And they can handle oversized and flat objects fairly well. Again, the cons are super expensive and they have an extremely large footprint as well. And they're complicated to, to learn and to use. That being said, uh, here are some more pictures of what you can handle. We can do our large objects. Um, we have a map over there, map of Trinidad on that platform there um, on the left. And then on the right side, we are doing pages of a book, um, one side at a time since we um, are shooting it from overhead. Um, we just have to flip the book around and take some pictures. Um, so yeah, reprographic camera systems. I'd be happy to talk about any of these more in depth um, after the presentation, if there's time. And you can always reach out to me, um, send emails, uh, get in touch with me. I would love to talk about this stuff with you. Okay, that being said, let's move on to some overarching concepts and some ideas that are relevant to all sorts of um, scanning and uh, image capture um, scenarios. Here we go, material types. The two main types that we deal with um, are reflective and transmissive film. Basically anything reflective um, is printed, it's a piece of paper and newspapers, books, manuscripts, even some 3D objects, we consider those reflective. Um, and transmissive is your um, film, your slides, negatives, anything that light can shine through basically to uh, illuminate the object, uh, it's transmissive and reflective. Some flatbed scanners like ours can do uh, reflective and transmissive, which really um, helps a lot uh, to have that flexibility. So you don't need a dedicated machine for both. Uh, that being said, slides are very, uh, they take very long to scan on a flatbed, but they, they can do a decent job. And uh, some quick file types, we're gonna go over some file types uh, quickly. We always recommend TIFFs if, if possible. Um, they are an archival file format. They should stand the test of time, um, depending on what the future looks like and the future of images and file formats. Um, hopefully we don't have to do any major batch conversion of image files 200 years from now when digital libraries are um, a whole new thing. Uh, so TIFFs, if you can stick with them, that'd be great. They are um, archival file format, they're lossless. That means that if you're moving them around, uh, doing any edits and saving them, you're not going to lose um, a lot of quality, uh, image quality. If, as if you were um, shooting and scanning and saving things as JPEGs. JPEGs can lose uh, quality, they lose resolution the more times you save them, um, send them through email, all sorts of things. If you edit them and do all kinds of things to them, they will eventually start to get really pixelated and we don't want that. Um, JPEG 2000 is one that we mentioned a little bit earlier. It's one of those um, file formats that we don't typically um, use very often. It, it does exist in our digital library, but it's more of a display. Um, image type. We don't really use it for um, saving and editing files anymore with JPEG 2000s. PDF, we always use those uh, depending on the material, multi-page documents. Um, you can compress them in many different ways um, depending on the derivatives and who they're going to, uh, where they're being loaded. Um, they're really good for optical character recognition, OCR. Uh, if you have text-based material that you want to get a transcript of, uh, OCR and PDFs work well together. Bitmap, uh, we just don't recommend that. That's a, an old file format that uh, yeah doesn't really serve much of a purpose, but it is an option in some scanning softwares, but I'd avoid it if possible. Uh, raw files, those are just typically the ones that come from the cameras. Um, they're not really an extension. They're, they are just raw files that contain all of the data from the picture that you took. Uh, from the raw files, you convert them into your, um, your TIFFs, the JPEGs, derivatives, and so on. All right, resolution, this comes up a lot. Um, so it's good to touch on. Uh, so PPI versus DPI, those are, they mean two different things, but they're often used interchangeably. Even some um, major software, um, Photoshop uh, is one who's guilty of this. They use it incorrectly sometimes, I might say. Uh, so pixels per inch, those, that's the actual image resolution when working on your computer and editing and saving files. Um, when you're talking about file size, we're, we're talking about the pixels per inch. 
dots per inch DPI, which is what you probably hear more often, that's typically used for output and uh, printing resolution. Um, so printers use dots and the computers use pixels. It's kind of one way to look at it. Um, either way, they use the same sometimes. Um, and the images that we digitize based on the FADG guidelines, um, Federal Archives Administration Digital Imaging Guidelines, something like that. I don't know. I have a link um, in our resources slide at the end. I highly recommend looking at the FADGI guidelines to get some imaging uh, recommendations for resolution, file formats, best practices, and so forth. Anyways, 400 PPI is typically what we aim to scan um, a standard 8 by 10 photo, for example. Um, if you're scanning a 10 inch object at 400 PPI, we want to get 4,000 pixels on the long side. Um, and that's, that's kind of our minimum there. But of course, yeah, things are different with each object. Um, each project has its own limitations. So if we can't get exactly 400 PPI or 4,000 pixels, um, then that's totally, it, it's okay. We work with what we can. Down there is a, a little formula. Um, if you want to um, figure out what pixels you need, what PPI you need, um, you can do that little formula. I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but it is on this slide and, it, and it's, it's really handy. All right, real briefly, pixels. We've all know, we all heard about pixels. Um, just in case, I'm gonna go over this um, because it kind of is the main part of uh, scanning and doing digital imaging is keeping track or keeping an eye on our pixels. Um, images have their own set of pixels, just like your monitors and your TV screens and all that. Um, typically more pixels equals higher resolution and it's gonna look better than a image with less pixels and lower resolution. On this image on the right, you can see an exaggerated version of what a high res versus low res image looks like. One scanned at 300 versus one scanned at 72 um, DPI or PPI. Um, I guess you could use whatever you want, but PPI is the real term. Um, it is recommended that we don't increase the pixel count manually via Photoshop or any other photo editing or image editing program that can lead to um, pixelation and other sorts of um, issues with your images. Um, color modes. I want to talk about color modes real quick because uh, this is something that most scanning software is going to ask you for. Um, what do you want your color mode to be? Um, we always scan everything in the Digital Library Center as color. We do 24-bit. You can do 48-bit if, if you have a lot of storage space, and that's not a problem. Um, but 24-bit is, is definitely acceptable. Um, these color ones are recommended for most images. They do provide the most detail, um, and they can always be turned into grayscale or black and white images later if we need to. So, um, it's not always necessary to create a grayscale or to scan directly in a grayscale or black and white color mode um, because you're losing out on a lot of data. Um, so everybody has their own different requirements and different situations, but at the, the DLC, we always scan in color and we create black and white derivatives if needed. These color modes are also going to affect the file size. Um, naturally, there's a lot more data and image data in color files than there are in black and white. And we can see, um, I'll show a comparison in our next slide um, and how, how the file size can change between them. Um, grayscale has just shades of gray in between, but no color. Uh, black and white files are really just that. There's two colors in the file, just black and white. So you're losing a lot of data in between. I mean, a lot of detail and quality in between. Here are, um, yeah, three examples of the different color modes that we just saw. 24-bit color mode all the way to the left. Uh, we have grayscale in the middle and a black and white file in, on the right. And at the very bottom of each image, we have the actual file size that these were saved at. Um, so you can see the range from 42 megabytes um, all the way down to two megabytes uh, for a black and white image. So if space consideration is a thing, um, then you might look into um, different color modes depending on the material that you're scanning. Not everything needs to be in color. If your institution doesn't require it, um, you can always turn it into a grayscale or a black and white. Uh, speaking of color, um, accurate color, color targets. There are many, many different types of color targets. This is just a standard um, QP card. It just has a couple of shades of gray and a white target. This allows you to analyze your highlights and your shadows in the image. 
but mainly we use it for getting accurate color um, reproduction. When digitizing material, depending if your machine is calibrated or not, um, if your screen is not calibrated, uh, you might get all kinds of odd colors. You might see some oranges. Um, and this, this grayscale, this gray um, color swatch in the middle there, depending on the monitor that you're looking at, it might look kind of orangish. It might have a different color hue. Sometimes it's got a little bit of blue in it. Uh, it should look perfectly gray. Um, and that goes for the software as well. If it's not calibrated, these devices will help you um, get the accurate color that you need after you scan the image. So quickly, basically the way it works is you include one of these color targets in your scan. When you're scanning, say a, photo, a color photograph, for example, you can tell your Photoshop um, or your image editing program to point to this gray swatch, for example, and it will automatically um, correct the color um, to match something non, I mean, something objective um, that you can tell is, is neutral gray, and that will help fix a lot of color issues. So I recommend that. And it's pretty complicated, but again, I'll be happy to talk more about this um, via email or um, questions later if we have any. All right. Um, yeah, some things to look out for, especially when doing flatbed scanning, since that's probably the more common situation when scanning material, especially manuscript material, um, documents, they can come with staples. Uh, we, we try to remove all staples when possible when digitizing our material, because it can definitely scratch the glass of a flatbed. Um, it has scratched our glass as well, and it is a pain to have that replaced. And it definitely will show up in the images eventually if the scratches are big enough. Um, and they do, it does happen. You have to start getting creative about where you place the objects on your flatbed because you start to see scratches on your glass. So if you can avoid staples or just be very gentle with, um, with it if you're not allowed to remove the staples. Um, adhesive, tape, glue, all of those sorts of things, they can leave residue on the flatbed scanning glass as well. Um, and that not only presents a problem for your flatbed scanner, but it also presents a problem for the next material that you're scanning. Um, if you put down uh, your next item on the flatbed, it might get stuck and it might get some residue on it if you don't, um, if you're not careful about cleaning. Um, closing the lid is also important. If you're scanning something a little bit thicker, um, then the flatbed, the flatbed scanner can potentially let light in, which is not a good thing. We want to control the light uh, that is uh, the light source that's uh, hitting your object. So it's sometimes good to put a little cloak, um, just a black blanket um, or a piece of fabric to cover up the, um, the entire scanner while you're scanning. Um, it's not always necessary, but it is a good tool to have. Um, also keeping it steady, uh, scanners are um, sensitive to movement um, vibrations. So we just wanna make sure that it's on a steady surface and there's not too much moving around, banging around, going on um, while scanning your material. So more things to look out when scanning. Uh, yeah, we talked about books. We just don't want to do books on a flatbed if it's avoidable. Um, of course, sometimes you might have to, and that's 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 your decision. And it it's really depends on each uh, each institution. Some problems with scanning books on a flatbed, other than destroying the books, um, can be that the gutters will, will get pretty dark because the light has a hard time getting into them um, and the lid won't really be able to close fully. Um, yeah, it creates problems with focusing since it's not completely flat. Um, film, when scanning film or transmissive material, uh, you also want to yeah, be sure that you're putting the film the right way. Um, you can flip it around, put it face down typically is what we recommend because the images can be reversed if you scan them the wrong way. And that will show up as um, backwards text on say uh, somebody's shirt. If they have a logo on their shirt, it'll just show up reversed. Um, that can be fixed in post-production, but it's good to just get it right the first time, put the uh, negative or the side down, uh, face down. Uh, so we check for those things uh, more, Moyer, however you want to pronounce it, those patterns can come up especially when scanning uh, reflective or um, glossy material, when you have two glossy material um, surfaces up against each other, such as a negative up on the flatbed glass, you can get this pattern, um, which can 
cause all sorts of issues. So you can fix it in post-production, but it's not very, um, it's not very good. You want to get it done first. So that can be solved by um, either putting negatives in a tray, which will kind of elevate the negative off the glass just enough. Um, sometimes scanning it at a different resolution will help, um, but uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. It can happen. It happens with half tone patterns as well. Um, as you can see in that image example, um, newspapers or magazine prints will, will do this often. Uh, so yeah, might want to look out for those. Um, yeah, another thing that does happen, and it's happened to us, um, sensors can go bad, they can get damaged over time. Um, over on the right side of this slide, you, I hope you can see it, um, the left is a decent scan um, versus one that was scanned with, um, I think this was scanned on the flatbed with a bad scanner, I mean a bad sensor. So you can see there's lines, there's all sorts of lighting issues going on there, um, and that issue is uh, it, it can be exaggerated um, with different types of material. So when you see something like this, it might be time to take your um, scanner in for service or, or to maybe be replaced, unfortunately, because there's not much you can do um, to clean it in some situations. So yeah, typically the bad or dirty sensor will represent itself as some small lines on the image, usually about one pixel wide. It might be a pink, purple, or a green line if you're doing it in color. Um, and yeah, just, just keep an eye out for those. Um, there's also uh, cropping and straightening considerations that we, we focus on for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah, crooked or skewed images. When you put something down on a flatbed and you want to scan it, it's not always possible to get it perfectly straight. Sometimes it's going to be crooked, um, skewed. Some scanners will allow you to correct the skew before you actually save the file, which is great. Um, but some like uh, Epson scan is, I mean, uh, a free program. It's pretty good, but it does not let you um, adjust the skew. It doesn't let you correct um, a crooked image before scanning. So you have to go into post-production, into Photoshop, and you have the program to correct it, which just adds extra steps um, and can slow down production. So yeah, um, it, other than just being more aesthetically pleasing, um, another reason to have a straight image is because OCR will perform better when the image is straight. Um, it has a much harder time reading something crooked um, and your OCR results might be a little bit uh, sloppy if, if not um, done properly at first. Um, yeah, so image capture and view scan are two pieces of software that can help with that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh yeah, focus is another one, um, more so with camera uh, digitizing. But we do have focus issues with scanners as well. Flatbed scanners, they do have a lens as well that can focus um, to a limited range. But that is something to check. Um, we always zoom in to 100% uh, when digitizing an, an object on a flatbed just to make sure that the focus didn't get um, knocked out of position. So most scanners will have an autofocus feature where you can just make it autofocus. And that's usually good enough. But it's always good just to check. Um, here you can tell on the right side, when viewed um, far away or zoomed out, it looks totally fine. Looks like it's sharp, it's crisp, it's in focus. But if you zoom all the way into 100%, you can see that it's very soft. And it, this one was um, scanned out of focus on our flatbed um, in the DLC. So uh, a quick autofocus will usually fix it. All right, okay, scanning software. All right. so. There are tons of different pieces of software, and there's always more of them. Um, there's free open source ones, and then there's premium, uh, very, very expensive proprietary software. Um, there's a whole range. Um, so depending on your budget and your institution and your requirements, limitations, that sort of thing, uh, we have a range of um, types of software. Um, over here, we have image and file management, uh, which allows you to do batch um, file renaming, organizing, while looking at uh, thumbnails of the images. Adobe Bridge is really good for that one. Uh, that comes in the Adobe suite. Uh, Creative Cloud is the one now that we are using. Um, image editing, which does strictly image editing to, um, Adobe Photoshop is probably the most common one. Um, GIMP is just a free version of it. It's just like Photoshop, it does most of the same stuff. Um, the user interface is not as friendly, but it, it gets the job done and it's free, which is great. Um, I recommend that to those who do not have such a high budget. 
Um, image editing and file management, some of them are combined into one where you can do these batch edits um, and you can organize, you can batch rename files, organize them, move them into folders and edit them at the same time. Uh, Adobe Lightroom and Capture One, they are very similar. They have different price points uh, for different types of versions and premium features, but they're both great. Uh, we use Capture One in the DLC and we recommend that one. Some scanning software for flatbed scanners, uh, Epson scan, image capture, Windows scan, view scan, and Silverfast. Uh, those first three are free of cost. They work totally fine. Um, image capture is a Mac only one, um, but Epson scan is, is multiple. Um, Windows, of course, you can only use on Windows. View scan and Silverfast, I believe those are both uh, Mac and PC, but they, they cost a, a little bit of money, but um, they, they can do some advanced scanning features. Okay, so um, Epson scan, this is the one that we probably use the most in the DLC uh, for several reasons. It can be as basic as you want it to be. It can just have some basic features where you can tell it the resolution and press scan and you get your images. Or you can go into professional mode where you can adjust um, a lot more detail with um, sharpening or color profiles um, and those, those kinds of things. So that's one that we recommend, it's free, but I believe it only works with Epson scanners. Um, uh, so for us, it works great, might not work for everybody. Um, image capture is, is a really um, capable program as, as is Windows scan. I don't really recommend the Windows scan. Uh, it seems to be more limited than all of the, all of the other free ones, but if that's all you have, it, it, it's on Windows machines, so you can use it for free. It, it does all different types of scanners, not just Epson. Um, and uh, yeah, image capture is Mac only. ViewScan and Silverfast, they have different price ranges depending on the features that you want. Um, we, we use ViewScan also if we need to do any major editing or complex kind of imaging. And editing software. We have uh, Adobe Photoshop, uh, Photoshop Elements is, um, I think that's still a thing. Um, I have to check and see it actually. The, it used to be offered as a standalone Photoshop, I mean, photo editing software. I'm not too sure if it's still around. Uh, it's worth checking on, actually. Capture One Pro is one that, that's what we use in the DLC primarily. And that's the screenshot over there on the right. That is a Capture One uh, screenshot. It shows you the file management um, portion of it on the right, where you can have all of your thumbnails. You can select them. You can apply one edit. Um, say brightening, you can uh, adjust the exposure at, at the same time to a bunch of different images without having to open them all individually, uh, which takes a lot of time. Uh, that's how you have to do it in Photoshop. But uh, yeah, Capture One and Lightroom will allow you to do this in, uh, in batch edits. And uh, yeah, it is worth mentioning that a lot of these um, pieces of software will um, allow you to have discounts. Uh, if you work at a school or university, um, some libraries, different institutions will have um, discounts available. So it's worth checking for those before making a purchase. All right, um, post-processing. We're gonna try to fly through this. Uh, looks like we have about 10 minutes left in the talk. So yeah, post-processing, that's an important part of, um, of all scanning projects. There is a lot that goes into it or a lot that can be uh, that can go into it, especially if you don't get a good scan from the beginning. Um, yeah, so color correcting, cropping, rotating, sharpening, exporting, file naming, stitching, they're all time consuming, lots of ings as well. Um, but yeah, these are just some of the things that we're going to go over really briefly. This map over here on the right side was a oversized map in a book, I believe. And this one was too large to fit on the flatbed or even in one frame on the overhead camera. So we had to scan it in two separate images and we used Photoshop to perform stitching, which is a, a, a common technique to um, put together more than one image. And it does a really good job of creating a seamless image. It's really, really helpful um, if you do not have an oversized scanner or camera setup you can scan oversized items by piecing them together. And Photoshop does a really good job. Um, usually does it seamlessly and you often cannot tell that it was pieced together automatically. So yeah, um, all of these, we're gonna go over some of them right now, right? Post-processing, here's a big one that we um, train all of our um, employees on is 
we do not want to use any auto adjustments. Um, that is our primary rule of thumb when doing image editing. We don't want to do it because you can see the two different versions. Um, on the left is an image scan with the auto exposure uh, feature turned on, and the uh, one on the right does not. It was turned off. It didn't have any auto features, no auto color, auto exposure, auto sharpening, none of that. We just got it raw from the camera, I mean, from the scanner. But you can tell that the one on the left just looks a little artificial. It might be more, um, it might pop more, it might look a little brighter, but it just does not really represent the original object. Um, so sometimes auto exposure helps. It helps sometimes, especially with derivatives, if you're trying to enhance faded text or um, anything that you just want to highlight. Um, it, it works sometimes with negatives and slide film when you um, don't have as much um, color data to, to work with. Um, so it does help. But I do recommend turning, on, turning off all auto features. Um, but it's totally up to y'all. Um, depends on what kind of images you're looking to get. Um, so yeah, not recommended. It can mess up your images. Uh, cropping, we talked about that a little bit a second ago. But uh, one other thing to consider, not only straightening the images, but we often will scan and crop to leave a little border around the objects. And uh, that's especially true with manuscript materials, such as this one. This is a good example for a lot of different editing and post-processing um, capabilities. When people are writing, handwriting or printed all the way to the edge of the page, um, while it might look nice and neat to crop it all the way inside the image, um, that will cut off um, potentially valuable information, um, especially with manuscript. They, they could cut off some words, it can cut off any kind of drawing that went to the edge. Um, and that is important, but it's also important to keep that little border around there because it gives users more context about the item. When it's cropped inside and if, when you remove any kind of background, um, you also remove a lot of context um, about the type of material that you scan, but also maybe the size, um, the type, yeah, the, the edges, if they were torn up or if they were clean cut. So we typically like to leave a, a nice even margin around um, each of the objects. And uh, file naming is an important one. I, it, I attached um, some imaging guidelines from FSU Digital Libraries, which includes um, file naming conventions that we use. And I would recommend taking a look at those um, if you don't already have any file naming conventions in place. It really helps um, to keep everything organized, easy to find. When we name our images, we try our best to um, tie the image back to the original location. So if it's in a manuscript box in our archives, we will name our file to reflect that location on the shelves so that if we ever need to download this image um, or if a user downloads the image and wants to find out where the original is, they can provide that information um, to us and we can potentially pull it if they wanted to look at it in person. Uh, so that helps when things get um, lost. Um, so yeah, also a major thing is to avoid um, special characters. We stick to um, only underscores and dashes. We don't use any um, yeah, special characters, um, spaces are a big no-no, especially when you plan to upload these to a digital repository. Um, spaces and special characters don't play well with the internet. Um, so yeah, it's good just to get rid of spaces if possible. If not, I'm sure there's ways to work around it. All right. Yeah, guidelines, best practices and standards. Uh, again, it is, it's recommended to follow some guidelines and best practices by those who have, I'm so sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Here we go. Let's see, file naming. All right, guidelines, best practices. Um, where was I? Right, uh, I included some links to uh, best practices that we have um, created, but also those that we borrowed from. There's no need to create uh, or to reinvent the wheel. Um, there, there are some really good guidelines out there for all sorts of institutions, um, all different sizes, small um, and large. So I recommend taking a look at some of those best practices and making them fit your institution um, and your needs. You can borrow what you need and discard what you don't, uh, but it does help to have a starting point. Um, and yeah, those links at the, the final slide will be, will be helpful. Oh, well, look at that. That's our slide um, and that's the presentation. And 
I included the Epson scan guide because that is it's pretty basic and it's um, it will show you how to do the most basic scanning features. Um, and that will also um, reflect other scanning softwares as well because a lot of them are basically the same thing with just a different um, a different user interface. Um, so I recommend taking a look at that if you're looking at getting started with scanning or training somebody on scanning. That's a good resource. Below that, uh, overall digitization guidelines, these will go over all different types of equipment, um, different types of material, uh, more advanced, more technical aspects of digitization. I recommend taking a look at all of those if, uh, if you're interested. Um, or if this, if this presentation was too basic, um, there are some really good resources there. And you can take a look at what we do at FSU. We have a couple of FSU links down there. Um, and I believe that is it. Thanks a lot, y'all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. And now I'm gonna uh, field any questions y'all might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Um, I will start off while we're waiting for questions to come in. Um, can you talk about maybe some low cost alternatives to um, a large format scanner for people who might have items that are too big to fit on the flatbed? Yeah, yeah. Um, some low cost options are, I would say the, low, the lowest cost would be to build your own. Um, and they do exist. Um, I don't have a specific uh, website that I would point to. Um, I, I can't provide that, but that's a good, uh, good suggestion. But yes, basically, if you mount a camera to a platform and you have it um, pointing downward, um, there are very very low cost um, pre-built ones that you can just attach any digital camera to and you can point it down to the object and you can get it to go as high as you want, as far away from the object as possible, depending on the size of the, um, the material. And that is the lowest cost um, method of digitizing oversized material. But yeah, you can always check B&H photo. Um, they do have some copy stands. That's the term that you wanna look for. Um, copy stands is basically, um, it's a wide range of oversized um, digitization um, equipment. They do have planetary scanners as well, but um, those do tend to get more expensive where you can push a button and it will scan from overhead. Um, but those are a little bit more limited in this, the size of the objects you can use. Um, and then I'll be happy to provide some links later on to, to those if anybody's interested. Thanks, Kayla. Thank you. And we do have a comment question in the chat. So it says, thanks, Stuart, for a great presentation. I know in digital preservation workflows that involve TIFFs, there are sometimes problems when these files become corrupted or malformed. Does the DLC use any TIFF validation software, or can you recommend any tools for such a process? That is a great question. Um, short answer is no, we do not uh, do any validation um, when saving the files. We, we do put them through a um, pretty rigorous QC project where we will look out for corrupt files, but that's just a visual check. We're just looking for any incomplete files that might have cut off um, when transferring or exporting. Um, so we do not directly do any, um, any other um, validation for those corrupt files. When we load them into the digital library, um, I don't know if there's anything going on in the background there that is doing some validation checks, um, but, um, but yeah, so no, we do not validate them on our own. Um, yeah, thanks, Dave. Thank you. And then um, I had another question. So you had a slide earlier um, and I don't think you got to talk about it, but um, it had more information about like the conditions in which uh, would be ideal for scanning. So like the, the room that you're scanning in, the lighting and things like that. Can you um, just touch briefly on some of those considerations? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I, I kind of glossed over this a little um, quickly. Yeah, thanks for bringing that, bringing that back up. Um, yeah, the, the room treatments thing, that is, uh, is pretty important. Um, that is a consideration you want to take more when you're um, doing photography um, of objects, not so much with flatbed scanning. Flatbed scanning, the light is usually contained well enough that you don't have outside light sources affecting the um, color of the objects. So 
with um, camera uh, work, we do have outside light sources, whether it's overhead lights or just lights coming from floor lamps nearby, um, or if your lights aren't calibrated, but also if your walls are not painted um, a neutral color, or if they are a glossy paint, they can and will reflect um, certain color casts on the images. And that's happened to us in the DLC. We had a big project um, where we had someone come in to paint our walls and to remove the overhead lights because all of that was affecting our images and we were having a really hard time doing uh, color profiles and correcting the images because there were so many variables that we didn't um, we didn't really know what to, <laughs> what to start with. So uh, yeah, painting the walls, fixing the light conditions, um, getting blinds or curtains um, for your room if you have windows is another good thing to, to do when um, setting up your room. Um, yeah, and there are the targets. We can talk briefly about the targets as well. Um, this target image there on the right, that's something that's used for that situation precisely. Um, if you cannot do an accurate color profile or if you're not sure what your lights are doing to your images, you can use these targets as reference. So we know that that gray swatch is perfectly gray. So if it looks blue, um, on our screen, we know that something isn't right, and we can tell our software to correct it based on that gray swatch there. And that applies to both flatbed and um, photography um, work. Thanks, Kayla. Thank you. Um, I had another question, but it has escaped me. Um, I think it was going to be, oh, when you have an image, uh, or not an image, an object, right, that might have curled edges or has been folded for a really long time and you're trying to get a good, nice, clean image, do you have recommendations for how to get a better image of something that um, might have been in a not so ideal uh, position for a long period of time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, yes, so flatbeds do a pretty good job of flattening most material. Um, because they do have the lid, um, it's usually a cushioned lid that can compress whatever material you're scanning. Um, this is more a problem when you're shooting overhead um, with an overhead camera or scanner. So if you do not have a flat object or if you're scanning something or photography, taking photograph, taking, doing photography, you have an object that has been folded or it might have ridges or valleys in it and it might be curled, yes. We, um, we recommend getting some glass, plexiglass, um, if possible. We, we, built, we got some custom made glass uh, different sizes so that we can lower um, down onto our objects that do a really good job of flattening them so that we can get a really good image of them. Um, so yeah, those have been uh, crucial when, getting, um, when, when we have those folded or bumpy objects. Um, so yeah, getting something like that can help there are some platforms, um, coffee stands that have vacuum bases. They're basically a platform that has holes in it and there are vacuums underneath that will suck the item down. It'll kind of hug it, keep it close to and flatten it to the platform so that you can take um, a nice clear picture of it. So yeah, uh, vacuum bases are, they're a bit more expensive but they work well on some material. Uh, but yeah, glass is, is the main thing that we use. Uh, you just want to look out for reflections and get anti-glare glass. Um, Anti-scratch glass is good, but that really helps um, a lot with flattening material. Thanks, Kayla. Thanks. And um, do you have any recommendations for cameras that would be good for uh, camera scanning? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, it really depends on budget. That's, that's pretty much everything. Uh, funding is a major issue. So on the top end of things, I like to recommend any of the uh, cameras from Digital Transitions. Um, and I'm just gonna put this in the chat here. Um, I don't have the website on hand, but if you Google that one, Digital Transitions, that's our primary vendor that we use in digital, uh, in a DLC at FSU. They have just a wide range of material, I mean, uh, equipment uh, from super expensive down to more manageable costs. Um, so yeah, anything from digital transitions is really high quality stuff. And that's what we, we recommend. 
Um, but also on the lower end, really any any digital camera will will give you an image. Um, it's a uh, yeah, we uh, DSLRs we recommend just because they tend to have better quality and more flexibility with lenses, interchangeable lenses, um, zoom lenses. Um, so yeah, we use Canon um, Mark II, um, Canon Mark II 5Ds in the DLC. Um, we use those for our book scanner, and that's not a particularly fancy camera. It's it's pretty basic. It is a full frame sensor. Um, so I do recommend getting a full frame sensor. Um, I, I didn't include that, but I'm going to put that. Okay, full frame sensors, they just um, allow much more um, data and detail to get in, uh, especially with the lenses, you have a, a wider um, frame to work with. So um, yeah, uh, anything, anything really, but yeah, Canon Mark uh, two 5Ds or those are really old, so anything newer is probably going to be um, a little bit, a little bit better. But uh, yeah, really anything. Okay, awesome. And if anybody has questions, oh, uh, here we go. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was so helpful. Would it be possible for us to download the PowerPoint? I miss writing down a few things. And the answer to that question is yes, we will be including the PowerPoint um, in the email uh, where we'll also be sending the recording link. Um, so you will get all of that material um, by the end of this week um, for your reference. And then next question, when scanning black and white photo prints uh, that have yellowed, is it better to scan in color or grayscale? Is it better to process the digitized image to the original black and white or keep it as is? All right, yeah, thanks, Michelle, that's a great question. Um, and that can be um, subjective. Uh, it depends on your, your guidelines in the institution, but at FSU, at digital libraries, we always scan it in color. Um, we will sometimes create uh, grayscale derivatives from the color scan, but with the color scan that allows you to perform um, better color corrections. Um, and if you scan it directly as a grayscale, you might not get as many um, gray values in between. So you might lose a little bit of shadows or highlights. Um, so it's, I, I recommend scanning in color, even if it is a black and white photo, because you can always turn it into a grayscale image after the fact. Um, that being said, it's really not a huge deal um, if you do it in grayscale. If the image looks good, um, then that's probably fine. I definitely would not scan it in black and white, but um, but yeah, grayscale is okay. I still recommend color, um, but yeah, yeah, it's it can go either way. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. And that would go for any other um, kind of object that kind of has kind of like changed from its original form, right? Like brittle or yellowed paper as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and we don't really do any any color corrections on our um in our studio we we kind of want it to just look exactly as we see it because we want our users to basically um get the closest representation to the original objects as possible um even if it has yellowed we want them to see what it actually looks like um so yeah and that that's a little bit harder when you're scanning negative film because typically the photographer would go in the dark room and they would print the photo to whatever um, whatever they thought would, would look good. Um, but when scanning negatives, you do have to um, put on kind of your um, photographer in your dark room hat and kind of make some decisions on what the image would look like because you do have to do some exposure adjustments and some color corrections on um, negatives, especially with color negatives. If you don't do any photo, any adjustments to it, um, if you're not doing it in a dark room and you don't have control of the color, it looks a little funky. So you might want to do some color adjustments um, on negatives and slides as well. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So thank you again, Stuart. Um, for your presentation. It had lots of really great information. Um, we will also be sending a survey out. So if you would like a part two, uh, let us know in that survey and we can work on that for you as well to have some more advanced information for everyone um, 
uh, for your scanning projects. Um, so thank you everyone for your time today. And thank you, Stuart. Um, if anyone has an addition, any additional questions, you can feel free to email me or Stuart um, and we can answer those for you. Um, I hope everyone else has a great day and uh, look out for that email. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Kayla. Y'all have a good one.